Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the first uh, Waltham Stone Rock and Roll Book Club of uh, 2022. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, if you haven't been to this before, uh, welcome to Waltham Stone and to the kind of book events we do around here. It's like this all the time. Um, let's. I could say, but I won't. For your benefit. Weekend starts here. You always be quiet. No, sorry, my friend. <laughs> How much lead you got on this? <laughs> <laughs> Who can't hear me? Who? <laughs> right. Nevertheless, I went to Jamaica with John, and it is the most exciting experience of my entire life because over the next two weeks, I'll tell you what happened. It was like Somebody beating a jungle drum, rich white man signing up reggae artists, Burning Spear and Bunny Whaler. And you know, I'd be sitting there with John, I'm surrounded by Iroy, Uroy, Big Youth, Abyssinians, Lee Scrap. I mean, it was fucking mind blowing. And I tell you, what was the most revealing thing is that these names that we thought were legendary in England, well they were legendary in England, in Jamaica they were, these guys were flat on their asses, they had no Absolutely. money. And that was Absolutely. really an eye-opening thing for me because, you know, they'd be blagging drinks and food off us, off us and even if they didn't get a record deal, they'd keep coming back to blag drinks. Yeah, no, no, Iroy would be, and culture even, would be at the bar at like seven in the evening. Yeah, and I remember sitting at the, uh, in the restaurant with Prince Varai eating a lobster, which is kind of not kosher with Rasta, and I'm like, shit tastes good, I'm eating it. Two, next day, Far Eyes ordering lobster. Every other day. Of course, <laughs> of course. But I mean, you went, you know, you went to Scratch Perry's yard, for example, didn't you? Uh, no, it's Uroy. But you went to Scratch's as well. We did go to Scratch's studio. Which and, uh, kind of must have been an eye-opener. Well, I'll tell you what was really funny about it, is that some bright spark at the record company, Virgin, by the way, had decided that it would be good to get reggae versions of some of the Pistol songs. Namely, uh, anarchy, in the, anarchy in the UK and uh, Holiday in the Sun. Surprise, surprise. Mind-blowing thing I'd ever heard because it was totally out of sync with everything else that was going on in Jamaica. And it was that tune, along with King Tubby Meets the Rockers Uptown, that really started my love of dub music. It used to really annoy me when people used to describe me as a madman because actually he's a genius. He was a complete genius. Absolutely. I mean, he's a mad genius. So, yeah, but, yeah, but you yeah, would yeah, expect yeah, those... The elements often go together. Peace for yeah, peace for absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but but uh, apart from Jamaica, I mean, you were also involved. You were involved with with kind of the punk scene, weren't you? I remember actually in your book you write, Malcolm McLaren defined what. You're right. Oh, you're was. doing really good at pretending you don't know me. <laughs> you're doing it for the people. I'm doing it for the people. Yeah, go on. Uh, it's tradition and lineage. He also helped me understand that if you were brave enough and had an idea, then anyone could be part of this thing that was out of the mainstream. And in fact, almost everyone on the punk scene was really intelligent, which kind of helped. Yes, that wasn't a question, that was a statement. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm throwing it to you. I'm, I'm, I'm it, giving it to you. To it to me. Uh, everyone was intelligent. <laughs> Not everyone, but most of them. No, the, the key players all were. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the reason, I, one of the reasons that we're still banging on about this fucking four letter word is that it wasn't just about music. You know, there's this old adage about, you know, anytime the clash of the pistols went to play in any city up and down the country, the next day, hundreds of bands would form, which is kind of true. But a lot of people also went to those gigs and they took that energy and it informed whatever they did. And that's why, in the wake of Punk, you had punk rock photographers, journalists, graphic artists, poets, filmmakers. You know, because I saw that energy, and it wasn't enough to be a fan, you wanted to be involved. So when my mates are picking up guitars, inspired by seeing the film Harder They Come, I wanted to pick up something too. And I picked up a Super 8 camera and reinvented myself as Don Lex the filmmaker. And I think, again, that's why we're still banging on about it, is that. It was very much a complete subculture in a uh -huh. way that 
no subcultural movement since. Only so opened things up. That's a good idea. <laughs> I'll call it a film. Stuck it together, showed it at the ICA, and that really launched my, I was going to say my film career. I don't know, career. Fucking hell. But that launched my time in the film business. Absolutely. And, and didn't, didn't Michael White, the producer, take you under his wing? Yeah, um, yeah, this guy that he produced, what is it, Saturday Night Fever or something? Yeah, um, yeah for, a, for a brief moment they were entertaining releasing it. Um, I'm glad they didn't, because truth be told, it's shit. Well, it's not shit. I mean, it's a documentary at the time, but I was learning my craft. No, no, enough false modesty, please. No, no, no. I mean, the only value that it has is that I had taste in the people that I filmed. So the reason that the Pistols stuff is good is because it's the Pistols. I didn't film it particularly great, you know. But then, as the bands got famous and started to get signed, they turned around and asked me to make their music videos. And that's really when I got my shit together. And I did the Clash's first video and did all their well, videos. Well, you did, you, you did the first public image video. That did, was the first yeah, video you yeah, did. Yeah, that's the very first one. Which was kind of like, kind of comes out really of like you having been in Jamaica with John. And then the, the, kind of the social scene that he used to have at his place in Gunter Grove as well. Which was like, you know, it's a kind of statement of, of, of the quintessence of multiculturalism, wasn't it? Yeah, before that word even existed. Exactly. Just, I mean, that was the thing about punk rock is that... It allowed everyone, if you had an idea and you were brave enough to partake, you know, it wasn't a, a sort of white boys network, but they stuck with me. So I owe those guys big Well, they're, time. they're loyal. Yeah. But listen, let's go back to kind of like, you, you know, when well, you're... Back in, further than we already are. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. To where kind of like, you know, you're a kid growing up in Brixton, you go to, to Archbishop Tennyson School in, in Kennington. Grammar school, Bradrick. Grammar school. Grammar but you, school. Were, but you, but you, were, you weren't you one of the only black kids there? Uh, for the first two years, I was the only black kids there. Absolutely right. How come? Because of that catchment area. Because it was a grammar school, Bradrick. <laughs> still in this fucking windmill. And I'm 15 feet from the stage. I can see the whites of Keith Moon's eyes. And that was it. My life was fucked. <laughs> <laughs> right, they, they opened this door to a world. That, and I didn't want to be a band. I didn't want to be a singer. But and I didn't even know what was unfolding in front of my eyes. All I knew was that I wanted to be part of this thing. And I didn't even know what this thing, we combine those things, we turn that shit into art. I mean, that's why in the last half of the 20th century, you have all these different style-driven subcultures to emerge in the UK. Kind of flatlined in the millennium. I mean, and the classing has a lot to do with it, because we couldn't compete with the middle and upper classes through the car we drove or the house we bought. But when it came to close the music, we'd fuck them up. <laughs> but Acme Attractions became like a kind of mecca on the King's Road, as much as, as, much, as, much as Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood shot. Yeah, do you want to tell them what it was? Or should we make them buy the book? Well, they can... <laughs> no, tell, I, tell I, them. I know you want to make them buy the book. No, actually. I don't actually. No, no, no. no, no. Acme, Attra Acme Attractions was kind of like... Uh, I, I mean, it, it was just kind of emblematic of all that was great about the culture. From kind of plastic, plastic sandals, plastic trousers, jukeboxes, great music, in the basement of Antiquarius, which was a kind of antique store. On the yeah, lots store. of acquaintances. I mean, you know, he didn't ring me up and say, "Come round and have a cup of tea." You know, I mean, well, maybe herb tea. But um, <laughs> he liked the weed, and then from then on, he'd come down to Acme Attractions to buy his tie sticks back then. Yeah, oh, great, gosh, fantastic. Know. But it was tie sticks, and that's the relationship that we had. That I sold him her, but along with a lot of other people. You know, this thing where they repeat things on the internet, it becomes true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, I don't need that shit, you know. However, there is this view. Oh, kind of like... hold up a minute, let me finish that go story. On, go on. <laughs> so Bob's buying a shitload of weed off me. One day I go around there to collect some money he owes me. And I'm wearing bondage trousers. You know bondage trousers? Yeah. yeah. And uh, he looks at me like down the lips, look like one of them nasty blood clot punk rockers. <laughs> He'd been reading the tabloid press, which kind of brought, portrayed the whole thing as being very negative and nihilistic. Which is all rubbish, really, because it was never about that. It was about empowerment, freedom, individuality. Anyway, Bob's taking a piss out of me, and I take offence. And I stand my ground, which was a big deal, because I'm like, I don't know, maybe 20 then, little baby dreads. And I'm like, Bob, yo, you're wrong. You know, these are my friends, these are my brethren, they're like-minded rebels, you know. To which he basically said, yeah, get the fuck out of here. And I left with my tail between my legs. Listen, on this planet, the most famous musician on the planet, it ain't Bob Dylan, it ain't the Beatles, it ain't Bono, it ain't Rolling Stones, it's Bob Marley. And not just because of the music, it's simply because 
of the state of the of the world. As long as you know, there's more people are being fucked over yeah. than there are that exactly. aren't. aren't. Bob will always be number one because exactly. he speak, He still speaks for them. Of course, no I mean, one else does. I mean, you can go to China and you won't hear Bruce Springsteen, but you'll hear Bob Marley. Yeah. No, it's a trip. It's a trip. Trade zone now. And he looks to his left and he looks to his right. And he's like, we look like a group. And I'm like. I, mean, I, you know, I, I can't play anything, like, don't worry about that. Neither could Paul when he joined the Clash, which is true. Paul was taught to play bass by putting coloured stickers on his fret. The difference between Don Letts and Paul is Paul got rid of his coloured stickers. Don Letts never did. Sometimes I'd be playing in front of 150,000 people supporting you too. And, uh, you know, with my keyboards and my coloured stickers and the spirits would take me, man, and I'd lift up the keyboard and show everybody, look, I've got fucking stickers on my keyboard. You know, just showing them if they had a good idea, you could do this thing too. You know what I mean? Still can't play anything. But, because I didn't do that, I quickly realised that you don't get paid for stealing other people's shit. So, through myself, with Mick's help, into lyric writing, and co-wrote 50% of the songs with me, yeah. food for the party. <laughs> I can't cook shit. I just wanted to meet Chris Blackwell. So I got my Rasta brethren to cook up a meal. I went in an electric zoot suit, and I'm in the kitchen help. We were overseeing the cooking. We serve the food, and then I take off my chef stuff and my electric zoot suit, walk up to Chris Blackwell, and I'm like, oh, I'm done, let you like the food? I'm like, yeah, right, yeah. It's me, brethren and then proceeded to hustle him for 1,500 pounds to start a band, which he readily gave me. He wrote something up in a napkin, actually. Of course, but a lot of his deals were done like that. Yeah, because it was 1,500 quid. I realised now I should have said 15,000 yeah, pounds. <laughs> but I took that 1,500 quid and started a band called Basement Five that ended up supporting Pill in their first two gigs. Yeah. And that's how I met CB. But through all that interaction, we struck up a relationship I liked him, he liked me, I think he saw something in me, to, um, I don't know, whatever. Because he, from then on I sort of made videos, I mean, you know, of course I made Bob Marley's One Love, Waiting in Vain, I made videos for Sloan Robbie, I can't remember, Bubba Marl, I did this long form Marley thing, Legend, and in fact, I think, I've got to flag up the thing that one of the things I'm most proud of is Chris Blackwell funded my first feature film, a film called Dance Hall Queen, co-directed with a guy called Rick Elgood, and him saying, we are sitting out in the garden, and I'm saying, I've got this really good idea. Why don't you two go down to Jamaica and see if we can develop a, a low-budget film industry? And that's what happened. Is that, I can't remember that's that. That's what bit. happened. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not in the book. Exactly where it all started. I'll tell you what, here's a much more interesting story. Who knows how Rock Against Racism started in this room? Eric Clapton. Who's it? Eric Clapton. How many of you know about the Eric Clapton thing? Eric Clapton is a Oh, I won't tell you that. <laughs> no, you know what's really funny is, you know what's really funny is, I've heard about it, and I thought that he'd just gone, yeah, I'm with Enoch. You know what I mean? Like he made a little sign. Have you seen the transcript? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for you, those of you who don't know, basically, Enoch Powell made his Rivers of Blood speech in 1968. Around the same time as in Nottingham, Clapton did it, Nottingham, Birmingham. Birmingham. In the middle of his gig, he breaks into this pro-Enoch speech that goes on, I mean, if I'm reading it, it feels like about five minutes, ten minutes. Wogs go home, nigger, I mean, it is unbelievable. This is the guy that had his first hit with, I shot the sheriff. And, uh, you know, he's only recently, in the last, I think, ten years, sort of said, okay, uh, you know, Sotley, Brinsley, uh, from uh, Brinsley Ford, from Aswad, and uh, yeah, one of the most amazing things, it has Josh Shaka doing his thing. Dennis Bavel. And Dennis Bavel did the soundtrack. Yeah, if you're not familiar with it, absolutely right. Babylon. Directed Super by... Um, Franco Rosso. Franco Rosso. Absolutely right. And it's kind of got lost in the mix, really. I found a poster for it the other day. I think, at home. Well, didn't you have an anniversary release a few years back? Yeah. It's got shelved, Channel 4 bought it and shelved it, and then it's come out again. I think it's quite on Netflix for one of them. Is it? It's on Netflix? It's on Netflix? Yeah. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. shit. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> and then he pauses for a minute, he goes, no, 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 give me two spliffs and one beer. <laughs> in an Irish accent, though. <laughs> but the Max in the studio, and I'd be in the green room watching TV, and all of a sudden I'm like, and I'm watching Good, the Bad and the Ugly, and I'm like, that's kind of cool, that section in there. And I said to me, why can't we just fucking take that and put it in the song? And he 
he was, he was kind of buzzed on it as well. And uh, that became part of the identity of the band. Just, and the samples, the thing about the samples in Bigotry Dynamite, no song was built on the sample. The samples were only salt and pepper. You know, it wasn't like um, Sean, what's his name? Puffy's um, I'll Be Watching You, or, yeah. or, you know what I'm saying? You could take the samples away and you'd still be left with a song. But as I said earlier, I quickly realized that you didn't get paid for stealing other people's shit. That's why I got into lyric writing. But no, one, no one else was doing that well, stuff with the we samples. Had the first, we had the first commercial hits with sampling, but then it was so new that no one knew what was happening. And the other thing is this, is that we were never that big commercially. So if you don't have that big a hit, there's not that many ribs. <laughs> yeah, six music, Sunday nights. <laughs> Sorry, this, what about your film, Rebel Dread? What about your film? <laughs> but joking aside, that radio show, Culture Clash Radio, I'm like, I am plugging it. It's one of the most honest things I've ever done. You know, it's not about punk rock Donlet, it's not about reggae Donlet, I can just be me. And um, your question about new music, every, through a third of every one of those shows is yeah. always new music, and every track is picked by me. I've never played a track I don't like. And, by the way, you can download it and listen anytime you want. Chris has signed the books. Donna signed the books. Chris, sorry, yeah, Chris is doing it as well. After John has signed all the books, and Chris, John, what book are you signing? He's got loads. He's got loads. So... Oh, no. 
man Who no better pay attention to this Something better. 